Hi, my name is Claire. I'm in 10th grade and I go to Sarasota High School. Our first scripture passage today comes from the 11th chapter of the Gospel of Mark, beginning with the first verse. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Just say this. The Lord needs it and will send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? They told them what Jesus had said and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Then he entered Jerusalem and he went into the temple and when he had looked around at everything as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the 12. Our second scripture passage comes from the fourth chapter of 2 Timothy, beginning beginning with the sixth verse. As for me, I am already being poured out as a libation, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. From now on, there is reserved for me the crown of the righteous righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. This is the word of God. Thanks, Claire. Give a round of applause. Well done. Uh, My name is Steve McConnell. It's been a month since I've been here, but they've had a vote. It was close and invited me back. So I'm grateful (laughs) to uh, be with you this morning. Let's pray. Thank you, O God, for this chance for us to be together and to hear again that wonderful story of Palm Sunday. And we pray, O God, that even in these moments, your spirit may guide us to understand what this story might mean for us as we seek to follow your your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And we pray this in his name. Amen. Mark Trotter tells the story of a woman named Georgine Johnson who lived outside of Cleveland, Ohio. Georgine had turned 42 and was not happy about it. So she decided she didn't want to look like a 42-year-old anymore and got in her mind to take up running. So she began running, and she began running a little bit, and then a little bit more, and a little bit more. She got up to two miles, three miles, four miles a day, and started feeling better about herself and less like a 42-year-old. And then she decided to give herself a little challenge and enter herself into a race. She thought she might begin with a 10K, a 10-kilometer race, about six miles. The race being, was being held somewhere in the Cleveland area, so she got there on the morning of the race. Lots of folks all gathered, milling around, and she heard on the speaker the announcement for the runners to assemble at the starting line. Georgine took her place at the starting line. The gun went off, and Georgine, with a mass of runners, was off and running her very first race. She had seen the outline of the course before the race, and it was one of those races where the runners just basically ran out three miles, turned around, and ran back three miles. But Georgie noticed that when they got to mile four, they had not yet turned back. And it didn't appear that they were going to anytime soon. And when they got to mile seven, Georgie knew that something was wrong. So she moved over to close to another runner, huffing and puffing, and she said, what happened to the finish line? What finish line, the fellow, responder, fellow runner responded, you're in the Cleveland Marathon. You got 19 more miles to go, lady. <laughs> Turns out her 10K race was scheduled a half hour after the start of the marathon. So Georgine Johnson decided, well, why not just keep running? This is not the race I entered, but this is the race I'm in. And she ran, and she ran, and she ran, and she finished. How could you finish this race for which you did not train, the newspapers asked. Georgine said that she started taking it just one mile at a time, 
and then a half mile at a time, and then a quarter mile at a time, and then a few yards at a time, and then finally one step at a time. Sometime life puts you into a different race than you expected. Last time I told this story, it was Palm Sunday, 2020. We had just shut down our sanctuary. We had shut down our lives. We were hibernating and doing whatever we could to avoid the dreaded plague. And we were scared and we were worried and we were not sure how this race was going to go. We knew it wasn't going to be a sprint. We worried it was going to be a marathon. But we kept running and running and running, one mile at a time, one half mile at a time, one step at a time. We kept open for business. We fed hungry people. We took care of preschool children. We zoomed and zoomed and zoomed and zoomed. And we're still zooming. Sometimes life puts us into a different race than we expected. Some 40 plus years ago, when I was graduating from college, I know that's hard for you to believe that I graduated from college, uh, <laughs> I started hearing about a young Canadian boy named Terry Fox. Maybe you've heard of his story. In the midst of college, Terry awakened with a sharp pain in his leg. Soon he was told he had bone cancer and that his right leg needed to be amputated above the knee. The night before surgery, Terry said God spoke to him in a dream and told him that he was going to run across Canada from shore to shore. No one-legged boy can run across Canada. But didn't, don't tell Terry that. Months after his amputation, he began training, working up to 13 and a half miles a day on a prosthesis. In April of 1980, he began his marathon. It was going to be a marathon to raise money for cancer research. He asked people to pledge money for his run across Canada. He dipped his artificial leg in the Atlantic up in Newfoundland and started his run. He averaged 28 to 30 miles a day. That's a marathon a day. But for the first 1,000 miles, no one really paid any attention. But Terry kept running anyway. Soon people began to see that this kid was for real, and all of a sudden pledges began to pour in with every mile that Terry ran. People began to crowd the streets of the small towns through which he ran. And after five months, Terry Fox had put 3,300 miles behind him. And that's when he began to cough. And that's when he started to feel weak. And that's when they learned that the cancer had gone to his lungs. And this time they couldn't stop it. But they couldn't stop the pledges. They couldn't stop the pledges. Terry had stopped running, but they couldn't stop people giving money. The pledges kept coming and coming, and months later Terry Fox died, but not without first raising $22 million for cancer research. And the race continued. Today the Terry Fox Foundation has raised over nine hundred million dollars for cancer research. Sometimes life puts us into a different race than we first expected. So, Jesus comes to the outskirts of Jerusalem, preparing to enter the big city, the epicenter of his religion, the powers that be, and the crowd that have followed him, and now they're preparing for a parade. And Jesus prepares for a parade too. Methodically, he makes his plans for his grand martial transport, and it's nothing what people would expect. He's going to ride himself a little colt. A conquering general would mount a white stallion. Pilate would cruise in a Cadillac, but Jesus is going to ride on a little coat. Matthew says it might have been, even been a donkey. And it all happens almost before anyone knows what's really going on. And all they know is that Jesus is the teacher. Jesus is the healer. Jesus is the feeder of 5,000. Jesus is the one who raises people from the dead. Jesus is riding his little donkey. And why not just join the parade? When Mahatma Gandhi decided to begin the movement against British colonialism, he started a parade. They called it the March to the Sea. And he started with 87 people, this parade that was to last 24, 240 miles and 24 days. They began with 87, this parade, and they finished with the parade going three miles long. No people counters with Jesus' parade, though, but a lot joined in, and they laid down their coats, and they waved their palms, and they yelled their hosannas, and they said a new king was coming to town, a new king, a, a humble king, a healing king, a feeding king, a teaching king. A new sheriff was coming to town, but this sheriff doesn't lock people up. This sheriff lets people go. 
This sheriff was coming to bring good news to the poor, release to the captive, sight to the blind, freedom to the oppressed. So they jumped on board and they followed Jesus, this little colt carrying the humble rabbi down the steep slope of, of the Mount of Olives, up through the Golden Gate and right into the epicenter, the temple. And depending on who you were, it was either a beautiful thing or it was an ugly thing. It was, either a, it was either a long-awaited ovation for the humble rabbi, or it was a bunch of hooligans stirring up trouble. And it's bound to happen when you're nominating a new king. It's bound to happen when you march to the sea. It's bound to happen when a new regime is being proposed. Not everybody's going to like it. And so they met in their huddles, and they decided they had too much to lose. And they brought charges, and they brought handcuffs, and they brought whips, and they brought them up to the place of the skull, and they brought spikes and mallets, and they hoisted him up on a cross, and they insulted him, and they watched him die. And now, all of a sudden, the disciples realized that they were now in a very different race than the one they started. Palm Sunday was supposed to be a little parade, you know, a, a little sprint down the hill, 10K at most. But the humble rabbi keeps going. He keeps going from the cheering crowd all the way to the jeering mob. This ain't no holiday parade. This ain't no quick balloons and bunting. This here is a marathon. We are marching to Zion, Jesus says. We're making our way to the Emerald City. But along the way, there are going to be some lions and tigers and bears. It's a tricky thing about Palm Sunday. We gear up for it like a 100-yard dash. But the truth is, it's a long way to Zion. It's a long way to the sea. And the truth is, the most meaningful races are the long ones. The long obedience in the same direction, to steal the words of Nietzsche and later Eugene Peterson, is the couple who celebrate 60 years of marriage. And they say it wasn't easy. And they say they almost quit. But life's a marathon and not a sprint. It's my junior high English teacher who woke me up to the passion of reading. And 30 years later, I decided to stop into my old junior high, and there she still is, 30 years later, still teaching to kill a mockingbird. Life is a marathon, not a sprint. It's Iris Sanchez up in New York City who got inspired one Thanksgiving to empty what little she had from her bank account, what little she had from her bank account, and bought food and took it to the nearby park to feed the homeless on a chilly Thanksgiving morning. She liked that experience so much, she saved up more and did it again. And she liked that experience so much, she saved up more and did it again. And then it wasn't just Thanksgiving, it was every week and then every day for years, four years, 40 years for Iris Sanchez out in that park. Life is a marathon, not a sprint. It's the Apostle Paul who, who started his race in the camp of Jewish zealots, rounding up early Christians, but then came the blinding light and the voice, and all of a sudden, he's in a different race. All of a sudden, it's a marathon. Years and years, beatings, imprisonments, shipwrecks, you name it. But life is not a sprint, and at the end of it all, writing from a Roman prison, Paul says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. March Madness is upon us, and I have no dog in that hunt. <laughs> and it makes me think of two basketball players, two professional basketball players named Jack Twyman and Maurice Stokes. They played back in the 1950s and 60s, both young men, high school friends from Pittsburgh. Oh, <clears throat> one went to play for the University of Cincinnati, and the other went to play for St. Francis. Both of them drafted to play for the Rochester Royals, which later became the Cincinnati Royals. And both men, one white, one black, were premier players in the league in many categories. But three years into it, Murray Stokes took a bad fall on his head, and three days later collapsed into the arms of his friend, Jack Twyman, and slipped into a coma a victim of post-traumatic encephalopathy, which rendered him a paraplegic for life. But, then professional, but back then, professional basketball didn't have insurance. It didn't have disability insurance. And so Maurice Stokes was left alone to fend for his own treatment. Not true, because he had Jack Twyman. And Jack Twyman was his friend. And Jack Twyman was in it for the marathon.
So Jack Twyman visited Maurice every day that he possibly could. He invited Maurice over to his house every Sunday afternoon for dinner. He made sure that Maurice had the best medical care. He organized an exhibition basketball game of all the finest players in the league to come together and to raise money for the care of their friend, Maurice Stokes. And they all came. The community of players came. Wilt Chamberlain flew overnight from Paris just to be there. And they came together every year for Maurice Stokes. And they raised money, and they made sure that his medical needs were taken care of for the next dozen years, when finally Maurice suffered a heart attack and died. But even then, Jack Twyman wasn't done with his friend, because Jack Twyman knew that between the two of them, the better player was Maurice. And so it wasn't enough for Jack to get inducted into the Hall of Fame back in 1982. Oh no, he was going to make sure that his best friend got into the fame too. So at 20 years, he petitioned the league to consider the three-year career of his friend as sufficient to be a candidate for the Hall of Fame. And he wore them down with his insistence. He wore down that league, and they finally let him in. And in 2004, they elected Maurice Stokes into the Hall of Fame, and his best buddy, Jack Twyman, got to receive the honor in his name. Sometimes life puts us into a different race than we expected and it's usually the long ones that matter most. And might that be something we think about as the rabbi goes riding by? Might that be something to think about when we wave our palms and, and cast our coats? Might that be something to think about when we see Jesus marching to Zion? That, just, that this just might not be a sprint. This may just very well be a journey of a thousand miles. Sometimes even with lions and tigers and bears. And sometimes with moments of utter exultation. Because that's what's bound to happen when you follow the new king. When you set up a new regime. When you humbly, like that king on a donkey, you start bringing deliverance to the captives, food to the hungry, sight to the blind, love to the loveless, freedom to the oppressed, homes to the homeless, friends, friendship to the friendless. You start bringing $900 million to the battle against cancer. You start doing whatever you can for the new sheriff in town who's now opening doors and throwing away the key. That's the parade we want to be in, right? That's the fight we want to fight. That's the faith we want to keep. That's the race. No matter how long, no matter how long, that's the race we want to finish. Let us pray. We thank you, O oh God, that you are the head of the parade. We thank you that you are the one who takes us into Jerusalem and to the table and to the cross, and to the empty tomb, and to wherever you have called us to go, to continue to fight the good fight, and to finish the race that you have set before us. So bless us, that we may be a blessing. In Christ's name, amen.